two. Um, so session two is by Professor Dan Foley uh, from Liverpool Johns Moore University in UK. Uh, so um, you guys are lucky you're getting people coming from other countries to come and uh, share their time and expertise with you. Um, so make the most of it. Dan. Okay. First of all, let's check if the mic is working. Everything's good. Okay. All right. So welcome to the first module. This is going to be on optical astronomy. Actually, most of the first half of the school is going to focus on optical astronomy before things branch out to cover the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, in the remainder of the school. And specifically, we're going to talk about imaging today, uh, leaving spectroscopy to a little bit later. Um, imaging is, unsurprisingly, one of the most fundamental things that we do in astronomy. We do it for a variety of reasons. Um, we want to see what's there. We want to discover what is in a patch of sky, whether that be a high redshift galaxy that no one had seen before, or a new supernova that has exploded and we did not realize had uh, happened until uh, that night when we appointed our imaging telescope to it. Um, sometimes we want to take measurements. We want to do photometry, which is actually to measure how bright an object is, how many photons it's putting out per second at a specific wavelength. Uh, or we may want to measure its position, which we call astronomy or astrometry, uh, which is astronomy, um, which is a precise measurement of where it is, perhaps whether it's changing its position in sky, which is used, of course, fundamentally to measure distances in the galaxy for parallax measurements, uh, as well as for some uh, extragalactic purposes as well. And sometimes you just want to take a pretty picture and show it to the public. Uh, so all these things fall under of uh, astronomical imaging. And so in the optical. The way that we take images is we use uh, telescopes with mirrors and lenses and cameras with detectors and shutters. So we take our detector, which I'll talk about how these work in a moment. We place it inside a camera, which keeps it cold, which keeps light out when we don't want it and lets it in when we want it. Uh, and it observes a field for a certain period of time and it records the image uh, that is incident upon it to a computer where we can analyze it later. Um, one nice thing about optical astronomy is once you have your image, you can often see your target right away. You can see stars, you can see galaxies, but you're not quite able to analyze it scientifically yet because in addition to those things, you'll have imperfections. There will be signals you don't want from the detector. There will be defects. There will be uh, patterns that are manu uh, artifacts of the manufacturing process. There might be gaps in your CCDs. There might be artifacts, uh, all sorts of things. We have to deal with them before we can take scientific measurements. And we call this a loosely uh, image reduction. And so that's what we're talking about today. Basically, the idea is we go from an image that looks like this, a raw image. It's got weird detector patterns, stripes. It's not very deep. Uh, and we reduce it and we uh, add a bunch of images together to go deeper. And we have a nicer image of the sky that shows all the stars and galaxies and is well calibrated and everything like that. And so that's the basic idea. Uh, so the outline of uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is basically as follows. So first, just a little bit of fundamentals about how telescopes work and mainly how detectors work, uh, since it's important to understand that to know exactly what we're doing with our data and why we need to do it. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how things work on the computer side, how these images are stored uh, to disk in a FITS format. Uh, then I'll talk about the actual imaging reduction processes that we do. Uh, I'll give a basic version. Uh, time permitting, and there's only so much time, uh, I'll also talk a little bit about the more advanced things that we sometimes need to do, depending on uh, exactly what we're trying to get out of our data and where our data come from. And then we'll go through the tutorial, which is a basic uh, reduction uh, exercise based on some data that we collected last year on an interesting astronomical object. Okay, are there any questions before I get started? Okay, so uh, this is basically all I'm going to tell you about telescopes. I assume most of you are familiar basically with how telescopes work. There's mirrors, they focus light, they collect light, uh, and uh, put it onto a detector, which is located at the focal plane where incoming light in parallel rays uh, is brought to a specific focus, and so specific targets show up at specific places on a detector that you would place there. Uh, and that's essentially, there's of course lots of details on how you build a telescope, how you do the focusing, how you keep things in good focus, and so on. We're not really going to worry about that. All you need to know is that there's a telescope and it has a focus, and that's where we put the detector. Um, thing that is almost always done uh, in astronomy when we're trying to do measurements is we insert filters into the beam. So these take what would otherwise be light that spans the whole optical or perhaps even the whole infrared, depending on what kind of detector we have, and filters it to a specific range of wavelengths that's more standardized. And so instead of getting the light from the whole optical spectrum, we're only 
focusing the light at a particular time in one particular band. So we have standard bands like the Sloan filter set here, U, G, R, I, and Z, or we have the Johnson Cousin set, U, B, V, R, I. And these are sort of a standard uh, set of filters that astronomy, astronomers use so that even if you're at two different telescopes on two different uh, observatories, you can take the same types of measurements and compare your observations to each other. And if you have multiple filters of the same object, you can say things about its colors, about its uh, spectrum crudely, and so on. And so that's useful. Okay, um, detectors. So behind your telescope, or inside your telescope, behind your filter, you need to actually convert the light into some sort of signal you can process and record. This is what we use uh, detectors for. Um, nearly all detectors that are used nowadays are based in one way or another on the photoelectric effect, which of course was discovered and characterized uh, by Einstein 100 years ago, and essentially involves you have photons, they impact some sort of special substance that uh, reacts with the photons, and an electron is liberated from sort of ground state to some sort of uh, excited conductible uh, state uh, at which we can um, do things with it. How well this uh, process works and how, what percent of the time when a photon strikes your detector and actually liberates an electron in this way is the quantum efficiency. Quantum efficiency depends on your detector and it depends on wavelength. Any detector you have is going to be better at detecting some sorts of light than some other sorts of light. So depending on what you are planning on using your detector for, you may have different types of detectors, uh, some of which may be, may be optimized, say, for red light, others for blue light, others for infrared light, uh, and so on. Uh, and we call how well this works the quantum efficiency. Uh, quantum efficiency is very, very good nowadays. It's very close to 100% at the peak. Um, uh, wavelength of a specific detector. So essentially every uh, photon that strikes it at that wavelength will uh, be recorded as an electron. But if you use a detector outside its optimum wavelength, it may be poorer. Um, of course, just having a detector is not enough. If we want to actually record an image, we have to have a whole bunch of uh, separate detector elements that are spread over the whole focal plane uh, to take an image. Um, and in fact, if we want to take a nice image, we need millions of these things, so even just 2,000 by 2,000, which is not considered a particularly high resolution or big image these days, you need 4 million pixels. Uh, and so this requires a lot of uh, effort uh, to create something like that. But fortunately, we have uh, technologies to do this now. And not only do you have to record them, you have to store them uh, while your exposure is taking place. You have to transmit them to your recording device. You have to amplify them so that individual electrons become a recordable signal and a macroscopic uh, device. You have to count them, and then you have to actually save them to disk. And so the technology that is used in the optical band uh, pretty much everywhere since the 1980s is called uh, the charge coupled device, or the CCD. Um, this is a different from what's actually used in the near infrared. But basically, any telescope uh, that operates at uh, optical or infrared or ultraviolet or even x-rays uses, if not a CCD itself, something that's very similar. Essentially, it's a grid of pixels that use photoelectric effect to convert light to electrons and send them to an amplifier to be recorded. Uh, a CCD, fundamentally, is a block of silicon, silicon compound. Uh, on one side of the silicon, there are a bunch of electrodes. Um, that apply voltages in different patterns to different places. And by controlling what voltage is placed on which electrode and by moving, by changing those voltages over time, uh, electrons that are uh, liberated by photons striking the silicon can be trapped in place while the exposure is happening, and then they can be moved around when the exposure is done so that we can record it. And so even if we only have one amplifier, uh, we can use that to register millions of pixels by moving the charge over to that amplifier. The analogy that is often used is a bucket brigade. We have a bunch of buckets in an uh, uh, array like this on some conveyor belts. Uh, while the exposure is happening, while the shutter is open, we have these raindrops falling into each bucket. Uh, when the exposure is done, um, the shutter is closed, and the buckets are moved in a specific pattern to transfer this charge to the side of the array and then to a corner of the array where there is a little amplifier which does all the counting, measuring, amplification, and so on, uh, and converts things to a signal, signal that can be uh, stored to a computer. And so if you want an animated version, here's an image. It's being shifted to a readout column, and then that readout column is shifted over to the amplifier. And so one by one, each pixel is collected by our single amplifier digitizer in the corner. And that's basically how CCDs work. Um, and then each time a pixel charge packet reaches the amplifier, uh, we record this 
uh, you know, it doesn't actually literally call it count individual electrons. It converts them to a voltage and records that voltage. That voltage is stored as a number on disk. That number is sometimes called the counts or the ADUs for analog to digital unit. Analog being the voltage signal, digital being the, uh, you know, binary based number that is recorded to disk. And so the fundamental number that describes how this works in practice is something called the gain or if you want to be um, more literal, the inverse gain. This is the opposite. Which gain is normally used in uh, detector physics. Uh, basically, for the number of electrons that reach your amplifier, this tells you the uh, equivalent number of uh, ADUs you get. So it's just the ratio of the two. For most instruments, this ends up being close to one, such that the number that you see uh, in your final image, your raw image, uh, essentially corresponds to the number of electrons. But there is a conversion factor that uh, is usually not exactly one between them. In addition to this gain factor, uh, there is also a bias voltage. So the amplifier, if it, even if there's no signal, does not actually send a zero to be recorded to disk. There's always uh, some voltage that's present, even with no signal. And so this is always there. And so when you read out an array with no signal, you have some number for all the pixels. Um, in addition, for near infrared arrays or for um, detectors that are not well cooled or perhaps some pixels that have problems, there may also be something called dark current which are electrons that are excited by thermal noise instead of photons. And so they're electrons that are also being generated in the absence of, of an astronomical signal at a sort of uh, constant rate. However, most of the time we can ignore that if we're dealing with optical astronomy. OK, so summing that all up in terms of an equation for uh, a given pixel that is exposed to photon flux with a rate uh, p photons per second over some exposure time t, the number of counts that we're going to get is that photon rate, the number of photons that are striking the detector, times t, plus the dark current, times the quantum efficiency, divided by the gain, added to the bias, and that's the number of counts that we get. OK, um, that's at least the counts we get in the simplest case where our detector is uh, perfect. Um, all detectors do have limits. They have linearity limits and they have saturation limits. Normally it's okay to assume that the CCD is linear, that if your photon rate doubles or that if you double your exposure time, you get double the flux in every single pixel. Normally that works. However, at very high count rates and uh, very long exposures on bright sources, you do have this phenomenon called saturation, which is basically you fill up the capacity of your detector. This can happen in digital space where basically we reach the largest number that the device can store, which is typically something like uh, you know, a binary number like this, 2 to the 16. Uh, or if we have a really, really bright source, then we have another even worse type of saturation called full well saturation, where basically the detector pixels fill up on electrons and they start spilling over into neighboring pixels. And it's usually very easy to see when that's happening because you have these uh, spikes that start coming out of your star. They're called blooming spikes. Uh, and so if you enter this very high counts regime, you no longer have linear behavior. Um, OK, but when all is said and done, we want to store our images. And nearly all astronomical uh, images, even outside the optical band now, uh, choose to store things in a particular format that's called uh, FITS, which is short for Flexible Image Transport uh, System. Um, it's a very simple file. Uh, it has two components. One component is called a header. And it's basically just a plain text um, uh, text file that's at the start of your file. Uh, which contains all the metadata. So what telescope you're observing at, how long your exposure was, uh, characteristics of your detector, where you're pointed at in the sky, almost anything you need to know if you have a, a good professional instrument is going to be written to that header so you can track it down later. And it's always there with the image itself. Uh, then the second part is that image itself, which is that 2D array of pixel data stored in binary format to disk. Um, for a simple header, it's literally just these two things. Uh, for a more complicated sorts of FITS files, you may have multiple headers and or multiple uh, images. Uh, in particular, this is what you get if you have, have a, a, a CCD array where you have a bunch of CCDs all together and they're all reading out at once and, uh, and saving their um, data to disk at once. So it looks something like this. If you load in a piece of software like DS9, you'll be able to look at your image here. And then if you uh, view the header, it'll look like something like this. You have a bunch of things called keywords. And then you have the uh, corresponding value for each keyword. So if you want to look up, you can see things like, uh, you know, whether this, this person, uh, whether it was using a slit, what the filter was, uh, the angle of the grading, things like that. So it's got all sorts of details in there if you're if you have a good telescope. <laughs> 
OK, so um, this is what we have at the end of the observing night. We have a bunch of these FITS files uh, corresponding to observations we took of our scientific targets, as well as calibration observations, which I'll get back to in a second. And basically, our goal as astronomers is to convert these raw files, combine these calibration and scientific data to a uh, reduced image, which is basically uh, a calibrated image that, for every pixel in the image, instead of it just being some arbitrary counts, it's some number that tells us the actual sky brightness at that location on the sky. And furthermore, ideally, we also want each pixel to be able to tell us specifically where it was on the sky, the all right ascension, alpha, and the declination uh, delta. And so that's what we want to have. So how do we do this? This is the task of image reduction. So there's basically four steps to sort of basic 101 level image reduction. Step one is we need to remove that bias voltage that I mentioned. Step two is we have to do flat fielding, which is to correct for the fact that different pixels have different sensitivities. Uh, third, if we have multiple exposures of a source, we co-add them, we average them together to go deeper and to remove artifacts. And then finally, we want to register it astrometrically to calibrate the locations of the pixels on the sky. And that's sort of the basic mode uh, task that we have. OK, so step one is bias. I already mentioned this to you, but this is just an illustration. So here is a, a CCD image that's shown in a piece of software. Here is a little profile that's taken through it. And so here's the part of the CCD that was actually exposed to the sky. And then there was a part of CCD that was basically behind a plate. So it was not exposed to anything, and yet there's still about 1,000 accounts worth of signal there. That signal has no astronomical meaning. We want to get rid of it before we do anything else. Uh, and so that is the goal of bias subtraction. Uh, the basic idea of bias subtraction is quite simple. Normally what we do is we take a special set of bias calibration images uh, during the afternoon or in the morning, time where we're not uh, collecting astronomical data. This is just a zero second exposure with the shutter closed. We take, no, we take no signal, we don't do any integration. We just read out the CCD a bunch of times and see how many counts show up and that's our bias level. We take a bunch of these, we average them together to, to remove noise, or any artifacts that might have cropped up due to cosmic rays or things like that. Uh, we average them together, we save it as a master bias image, and then we simply subtract pixel by pixel that image from uh, all our other images in the, uh, from the um, that's the general procedure. There are other ways of doing it. In particular, one of them is called the overscan method, where we actually clock out, we read out the CCD an extra number of times compared to normal. Um, um, so if your CCD supports that, that is an alternative. What, which one you want to do depends on whether your bias is actually stable with time, or whether it's a simple, there's the same bias level for all the pixels, or whether the different pixels might be different. Um, but uh, either or, or the other is, is how things work. Um, so this is an illustration of that. So here is you know, a raw image with a telescope of a particular part of the sky. Uh, here is a bias image that was taken earlier in the uh, afternoon. And you can see this bias image does show some structure. There's this sort of hot column feature here. There's kind of a gradient over here on the right. So we want to remove those sorts of patterns, and we want to remove the overall bias level. So we just subtract A minus B, and we get a subtracted image that removes some of those patterns. So there's still a dead pixel column here that we have to deal with later, but we have mostly fixed at least this hot pixel column on the left. So that's step one. Uh, let me pause just in case there's any questions and, uh, that anyone has so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, uh, why, uh, so, yeah. so if um, everything behaves, basically we could that for, there's a possibility that on one of our exposures, a pixel could be struck by something called a cosmic ray. Um, and that's an actual, it's not exactly an astronomical signal, but it's a signal that we don't want. It's a signal that doesn't and If we take a ordinary cosmic ray hit, we'll still be in the of problematic signal in our bias. Whereas a median removes any sort of individual exposures that had something funny about them, including cosmic ray, could be other things as well, uh, all come out when we do medians. So medians are used all over the place in optical uh, astronomy to remove sort of these individual stochastic things that can sometimes happen. Yeah. Um, well, basically, nighttime uh, data, nighttime time is valuable, 
And so we could be taking data of other astronomical objects. So we, can, we, we save our calibration time for the afternoon uh, when we can. Now, if, you're, if your bias level is very unstable, you may not have the luxury of doing that. You may have to take a bias image right before and right after the observation. But uh, generally, we do it in the afternoon to save time. Yes? What's the number? Um, usually you don't need too many, but it, it all depends on, your, on exactly what you're doing. Um, um, typically you'll take something like 10, uh, maybe even 5 is okay, because it's rarely a dominant source of noise. So you, do, you want to take a few to remove those cosmic rays and things like that that could go wrong in just one exposure. Um, but you don't need too many because you're not really limited by, by, the, by, by the noise in your bias or anything like that. Okay, so step two is uh, flat fielding. And so this is basically to deal with uh, two related uh, issues. One is that your detector is not a million perfectly identical pixels. Every pixel has its own slightly different properties. They have different sensitivities. They have different quantum efficiencies. We don't want that sensitivity pattern to be imprinted in all our astronomical data, so we have to calibrate it out. In addition to detectors, also differences in the optics. Um, Different parts of the field may um, be exposed to slightly more or slightly less light. Um, there may be dust particles that are sitting somewhere within the focal path. Um, so, so, for example, this is a detector and you can see all these little donut rings. Those are out of focus dust particles. And then there's also these smaller things. Those are closer to in focus dust particles. And then there are these horizontal bars, which are manufacturing artifacts. We do not want those in our astronomical data, so we've got to get rid of them. And the way we do that is uh, flat building. Um, this is very simple. Um, basically, we calibrate our data by observing a source that we think is pretty much just a flat white screen. Um, and so that can literally be a flat white screen, which is something that's going to be mounted in the dome somewhere. Um, and that's called a dome flat. So we basically point the telescope to, a, you know, to, a, to this white cloth on the side of the dome. And we take a bunch of exposures up. Uh, with a uh, special lamp that's shining on it that uh, is ideally as uniform as possible. So that's nice because we can do it any time, including the daytime. It's very stable because we can control how bright the light is. Um, but as, as uniform as we think our screen might be, it may not be 100% perfectly uniform. And the lamp is going to be some sort of you know, black body reddish thing and not really have much UV signal. So this is good for some sorts when, 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 uh, when you need to, but it's not necessarily going to produce the absolute best calibrations that you can get. You can usually do better uh, by using the sky itself uh, during the uh, twilight period, um, shortly after sunset or shortly before the uh, sunrise, when there's sort of scattered light basically from the sun uh, shortly after the sun has gone down. And that is actually the sky. Um, and so it is closer to uniform illumination aside from a little bit of sky gradient. And it does have UV signal. Um, so it's better in that sense. On the other hand, the sky level changes rapidly with time. You only have sort of like 20 minutes where you can do this before sunset, before things get too dark that you don't have enough signal. Um, and it also had, will have some stars in it that you have to process away. Um, but essentially, one of these two things is how we collect most of our uh, uh, data uh, for flat fielding. So once you've done that, you get a bunch of exposures. Just like with the biases, you get several. You medium, medium them together to remove cosmic rays. And in the case of twilight flats, that also helps uh, any stars. Um, so you take these in the same filter, you know, the same uh, band as you're going to use for your science data. You uh, normalize each one of them because the light level might be changing. You don't want uh, that to be your final data set. So you divide each one by its, each individual image by that image's median. Uh, and then you stack them by median combining them all, and that gives you a uh, master flat field in that same filter that you acquired your data in. And then you divide each of your science image by that flat field image to calibrate things away. Uh, as always, it's easier to see this with a little visual demonstration. So here is a science image, and you can see there's those horizontal bars. There's kind of a little bit more signal here than in the center. Um, we want to calibrate that away, so here is our you can see it has those bars, it has this circular pattern, and you divide this by this, and those things go away. And so you have a nice flat, that's why we call it flat fielding, there's no longer these uh, spatial variations, flat image uh, left over. <laughs>
And now we're getting close, so we've got rid of most of our detector uh, patterns, extra signals. Most of those have gone away. Um, so now we just have a couple more things to do. Uh, next is co-addition. Usually, um, if we're observing a source, uh, we take more than one exposure of it. We may take three, we may take five, we may take nine or more, depending on exactly what we're trying to do. We do this for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have the saturation issue where if you take, say, a 900 second exposure or an hour exposure, you're going to blow away all your bright stars and then you can't use them for measurements, you can't use them for calibration. So instead we split it up into a bunch of individual exposures and then those bright stars are less likely to saturate. Um, this also mitigates against things like detector artifacts, cosmic rays, all those things uh, can be uh, removed if we take lots of uh, images. Um, if a telescope wasn't moved in between our imaging sequence, this is very simple. We simply just average them together in software. We just add them after the fact. More likely, we, wanted, we do actually move the telescope a little bit from image to image, and that is so that these little detector artifacts like these uh, Horizontal, these vertical bars that were kind of left over, these are actually bad columns on the detector, uh, is that those land on the sky and so they can be removed as well as long as we move the telescope back and forth. Um, however, this does give, mean there's extra work because we have to undo this motion. We have to shift the images appropriately to line them up with each other uh, before we can stack them. But of course, this is not difficult to do. We just find a star that's present in every image. We measure its position. We measure the offsets. We shift things accordingly. Uh, and so we have all these images, uh, so say just three images here, same patch of sky. We've lined them up appropriately. And then we co-add them. And uh, at least in the part that is overlapped by all three images, that removes most of the artifacts. And it beats down the noise by averaging um, it together. And we have a mostly clean and deeper image that we can then use for scientific analysis. OK, uh, any questions on that part? Yes? Yes, so um, when you take your twilight flats, you in general want to move the telescope around because otherwise the stars are going to be in the same position in every single image. And so when you do the median combination, there will be stars in your overall flat field. So it's a good idea to move together, as we call it, uh, for the flats as well as for science observations. Yes? Um, you always do bias subtraction at the beginning, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that's also a good question. Do you use different exposure times for different images, or do you want them to be the same? Um, usually, just to keep things simple, we use the same exposure time for our science images. Um, for flat field images, if we're doing dome flats, usually we use the same exposure time. But if we're doing twilight flats, we usually don't. And that's because the skylight levels are changing. And for example, if uh, it's the start of the night, you know, right away we have to use, a, just after the sun sets, we use maybe a one second exposure, because otherwise our CCD will saturate with the sky. But then 30 seconds later, a one second exposure, we sort of gradually increase our exposures with, for doing twilight. But generally, it's a good idea to keep exposure times constant for science data, because then your saturation properties are more regular. And we don't have to scale the images to correspond to the different exposure times when we add them later, if we're doing a median combination. OK, uh, so our last step is the astrometric calibration. And so this is based on the FITS header, so the way that astrometric information is stored typically is with a special set of keywords uh, that are nicely standardized and have been for a long time. So basically every um, piece of astronomical software that you encounter uh, will use the same basic convention for um, simple um, astrometric information. Basically, it's uh, equation-based. So there's a set of standard equations. Uh, there's a matrix here. It's called the CD matrix or the transformation matrix that converts an offset in pixels uh, as measured from some pixel that you can choose, it's up to you, and designated by two particular keywords that are there in the header of every uh, image. And using this transformation matrix, which encodes the rotation and it encodes the, encodes the pixel size, uh, it translates that offset in pixels to an offset from a pointing center in actual uh, degrees, or arc seconds, or arc minutes, or whatever unit that you prefer. And so just by writing the right uh, parameters to the header, uh, this allows astronomical software to look at an image and translate between um, uh, 
cycles and uh, position. Yes? You have a linear transformation there. Can, that, can you also account for distortions in the field? Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, yes, you can. Um, it's much more difficult because it's not well standardized and different software uses different conventions. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But uh, yes, it is also possible to store distortions. And for precision astrometry, that is usually needed. Um, of course, the way this works to astronomically calibrate the image is you need um, some reference standards in your science image. So if we uh, identify some stars. You need at least two. Ideally, you want as many as possible um, in your image. You record their pixel positions. And then you go to an astrometric catalog of a bunch of stars in the sky. You find the ones that might be in your field. You match them up. So you know A to A, B to B, and so on. And then by using this transformation equation, you solve for the relevant header parameters. You write them to the header. And then um, the software should be able to do the translation. And so you end up with something like this, where you have uh, an image. Uh, and you can load it in your software. And you can you know, put your cursor over somewhere. And it will tell you not only the pixel, but it will tell you the position. And things like photometry software and other analysis software will also be able to do that um, translation. OK. Any other questions? OK, so there's a bunch of advanced topics. And um, in the interest of time, I'm not really going to go through them in any detail. So we're going to go through power modes the rest of the slides. These slides will be online. And I highly encourage you to look them up yourself uh, if you end up doing optical astronomy um, and image reduction uh, in your future career so you understand you know, <laughs> what these things are. And if you do need to use them, you don't always need to do these different steps. Uh, but they do arise sometimes. Bad pixels, we already encountered a bad Kalman array. Usually they median out. But that's not the best way to do it, because that can actually bias things even after the median uh, fix, after, after the median combination. Ideally, we want to look these up and fix them in our image. Uh, we have dark current in infrared detectors and perhaps some optical detectors. If we do, we don't use bias frames. We use dark frames instead. There's charge transfer efficiency. We tend to assume that all the charge that's recorded in a pixel makes it to the amplifier in that same pixel packet. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it gets left behind. If it does, and this typically is encountered in space-based telescopes like HST, we have to correct for that too. Uh, fringing is something that you are likely to encounter if you take observations in uh, the very red uh, side of the optical, or the related phenomenon of sky subtraction if you do infrared data, which basically has to do with the fact that we take our flat fields, but our flat fields are only an approximation of what we see on sky because the sky has a different spectrum as our flat. And the flat pattern is actually different at night. We have to correct for that by taking uh, basically median combinations of nighttime data and subtracting them uh, as so. Uh, cosmic rays, I've already alluded to them. These are uh, energetic particles that strike our detector that b basically blast through everything. They can come from actual cosmic rays, or they can just come from terrestrial radioactivity. Uh, again, these tend to median out if we do a simple median combination of our science data. But if we're processing individual exposures, or even if we want to do things well and we're doing a median combination, we do want to detect them and we do want to filter them out. And usually we can do this with some sort of spatial filtering algorithm. There are lots of packages out there uh, that will let us do this. Uh, distortions, we already had a question about distortions. If you're doing precise astrometry or if your CCD is not nice in its properties and has big uh, uh, distortions, uh, you ideally want to solve for these using a specific software package and write it to the header. Unfortunately, there are different conventions for how distortions are solved and fit, so this is not a trivial thing to do. Um, so make sure you understand uh, what you're using and what other software packages actually recognize it if you're doing distortions. Or you can just resample things to a common grid yourself and uh, remove the distortion pattern. Uh, and then finally, we may want to actually calibrate things photometrically, not just astrometrically, so that not only does our pixel tell us how bright each pixel is relative to each other, but it's in sort of absolute sense that we can use to measure things absolutely. Um, and that will be talked about more in the next lecture, which is because it's highly related to uh, photometry. OK, um, as I said, that was power mode. We can come back to that later uh, after this lecture if you're interested in any of those things. Um, but just to wrap up, before the module, I thought I'd end with a few pieces of advice. Image reduction, image reduction is nice because it's intuitively simple. It's visual. You can see everything every step. And so it's often straightforward. But there are often complications that come 
So if things are not looking right, if your image has funny patterns in it that you don't understand, uh, it's important to understand uh, why and um, to deal with it appropriately. So the key is really understand your instrument, understand what you need for your science, uh, and understand what steps you need to do, and understand what steps that you can skip. Okay, um, so that's all for the lecture. We're going to now progress to the actual tutorial. Um, but let me stop to see if there's any questions on any of that content before we do that. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so because I, I went really quick to dark images, I didn't really talk about how they're collected. A bias image is a zero second exposure. You don't actually, um, and you just read the CCD out to clear the charge, and then you immediately read it out again. Uh, bias voltage is. So no time for anything to accumulate. A dark exposure, you read the CCD out, you flush the CCD, and then you wait a certain period of time. The shutter is closed, so no photons are coming in, and it should be completely dark, so there's no photon-induced photoelectric current, but you could be having dark current. So there could be electrons being excited randomly from thermal noise. And so we wait for those electrons to accumulate over some period of time, 60 seconds, 300 seconds, whatever is going to match our science data. And then we read it out again to collect those thermal electrons and, and measure them. Yeah. Yes. I've never been able to figure out what the overscan columns are for. What the overscan columns are for? Yeah. So I breezed through that also. Um, that is an alternative way of taking a bias measurement. So um, you have a, a, an array of, of of pixels, and when you take an astronomical exposure, each of those pixels is, is um, uh, exposed to uh, light, and so it contains astronomical signal. You read them all out. And so you clear all the pixels by moving each one and shuffling them to your amplifier. And then you continue reading out. There's nothing that says you can't. Even though every pixel is cleared, you can continue reading in more signal. And that is bias voltage. And so basically you're getting a bias, some extra bias data for free right after you read out your science exposure. Yes? Uh, sorry. An unstable bias. Yes. They introduce variability. Um, well, an unstable bias is a reflection of variability in your detector. If your bias level is changing with time and you don't correct for that in your reduction procedure, then some of that bias signal could uh, then sort of seep into your astronomical measurements. It'll, your photometry step will mostly remove it again um, because you, you end up subtracting the sky anyway before you actually measure the count of a star or something like that. However, your bias, your leftover bias gets flat fielded, so it introduces a flat fielding pattern where one didn't exist before, and this starts to cause imprecisions. So you, you know, you don't, you ideally want to remove the bias properly and not leave it in there. Yeah. What physically with your detector causes bias variability? I do not know the answer to that. <laughs> Why the bias would change? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so the question was, why would the bias vary with time? And Christopher's answer was, uh, variation in the electronics, variation in the detector temperature could, in principle, all do these things. Okay, so we'll do the tutorial next, which is going to involve a computer swap, uh, Igor, uh, if you're ready. And so you should hopefully all have this downloaded already. Uh, we'll just swap it up here.